Amen. Y'all give another round of applause for our band today. Aren't they awesome? Thank you, Matt. Josh Egler, as I like to call him, Noah and uh, Luke helping out today. We are grateful for y'all stepping up and leading us in worship today. Well, I'm excited about this new sermon series. I hope y'all are too. I guess you probably can't be too much. You don't know too much about it, but uh, first of all, welcome. My name is Cole. For those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm one of the pastors here at Providence, and I am glad you all are here. I hope you all are ready for a sermon today because uh, I told uh, my wife who was traveling this morning, I said, just feel so good today, Lindsay. I can't help it. She's like, you need to like bring it down a few notches, dude. So like if I start coming off the stage here in a second, it's just because I'm really excited to be here. And I think God has a word for us today. And I'm excited to be part of that. Would y'all do me a favor? All right, everyone kind of loosen up a little bit. You loosen up in your chair, sit up straight. Now you're going to, you're going to touch your neighbors probably on this, but open up your arms, open up your arms. Let's pray. Oh God, We are open today because we want to be filled by you. Come and meet us here in this place. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. God, our rock and our redeemer. And everyone said, amen. Well, we're going to start right out reading some scripture. We're going to read scripture from John chapter 21. And it's kind of a lot, so buckle up. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. John 21, 1 through 19 says this, and this is at the very end of John's gospel. So this is the last last chapter in this gospel. It says this, Later Jesus himself appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter... Thomas called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood there on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. (laughs) He said, Cast your nets on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they did, and there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the nets. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to the shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus said to them. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15, when they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. Jesus said to him, I'm getting out of order here, sorry. Yes, Lord, you know I love him. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around whenever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. We give thanks for this word, O God. Well, today and for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about messy spirituality. It's, uh, I'm directly taking this from Mike Iaconelli's book, uh, which the subtitle is my favorite subtitle maybe of all time, God's Annoying Love for Imperfect People. I love that. We're going to talk about how we're all just a hot mess. 
in our own spiritual lives and how that may be okay. You know, whenever I think of my own spirituality, I think of where it started for me, and I used to love to spend a bunch of quiet time. Like in high school, I had, uh, my room was in the basement. It was only the only bedroom in the basement, so I would shut the door and light all these candles and just turn on soft, soothing music, and I would just soak in the presence as it was. I mean, these were some really cool hours and hours. I'd be praying, and I'd pray for everybody, and I'd write notes and just have this lovely, lovely spiritual time. Okay, so that is peak spiritual time. That's what I want to tell you about, but the reality is, more often than not, what would happen is I would start, I'd light the candles, set the music, lay down and start praying, and then three hours later, my mom would knock on the door because I'd fallen asleep. <laughs> That's what spirituality often looks like for me. Whenever I want to go into this deep spiritual zone, I occasionally find myself nodding off to sleep and hopefully having good spiritual dreams or something. I like to think that I'm a spiritual guy, that I practice my faith enough to know that I'm living a real and meaningful life, but the truth is, and maybe you can relate to this if you haven't already noticed today, I'm a mess. <laughs> I'm an absolute mess. Some days I'm really good at reading my Bible first, day, first thing in the morning. That's what I try to do is get up and turn on the lamp and grab a cup of coffee and sit there and read the Bible. But other mornings, maybe many mornings, I find myself zoning out to ESPN to see if the Hurricanes uh, beat the Capitals. They did, sorry, Matiers, or if, uh, you know, see which team has won what lately. Some days I fall right back asleep when I wish that I was praying. My spiritual life is inconsistent. At best, I wish that I prayed and read and meditated and fasted all the time. All of those practices that we went through, if you were with us in our Lent uh, sermon series called Wilderness. But spiritual, spirituality, at least for me, is more messy than it is consistent. It's more hit and miss than it is every single week profound. It's more real than it is picture perfect. And I think that's okay. I hope you hear that about your own faith life today, that it's okay. Messy spirituality, I want us to think about God's annoying love for imperfect people ourselves. People who don't have it together all the time, who rarely get it right, and yet God still chooses us and loves us and accepts us. We're going to explore more through what this means, but as I prayed through it and thought about it, I got to experience it firsthand. You know, I was Googling messy spirituality, which is where I don't care how long you've been trained for being seminary and all that kind of stuff. The first thing you do whenever you're about to write a sermon is you Google it and see if there's any cool video or song or, or something that pops up. So I Googled it and I went down this rabbit hole of really great preachers who were preaching about messy spirituality, Mike Iaconelli talking about the book and all this cool stuff. And the thing that ended up hitting me the most was a video by Drake called God's Plan. <laughs> Here I am trying to be really deep and spiritual and profound. Instead, God's Plan on Drake on YouTube popped up, and I thought, what the heck? I'll see what this might speak to me about messy spirituality. So five minutes and 15 seconds later, I was doing the whole, I'm not crying, you're crying sort of thing as I listened to Drake's music video. Seriously, though, I was an absolute wreck. You should go home and look at it. There's a clean version, by the way, if you need it. Uh, I, was, I was sobbing. I was so moved by the love and tenderness expressed in the music video where Drake decides to take the budget, he says, a little less than a million dollars and go in the Miami-Dade County area and give it all away. He went out to different shelters and to different impoverished people and marginalized people and, and helped single moms and homeless people and uh, uh, youth at risk more and more. Drake, who is an imperfect person to be sure, I'm not lifting him up as a hero of our faith, but maybe he felt led by God to share what he had, to share love, to touch thousands of lives over just the course of a couple of weeks. You know, we clean up here in church. We get all nice, and I've talked about that before, and I'm grateful that you decide to wear deodorant and do your hair a little bit and come to church. That's a really good thing, but we present our best selves at here at church, and so that becomes the expectation for anyone who walks in. To be part of this community, I must look a certain way, must act a certain way. They must have their lives together, so for me to fit in, I need to have my life together too. But the truth is that God is in this habit, and Iaconelli calls it annoying, of showing love through imperfect people, through honest people, through people like Drake, <laughs> like me, like you, perhaps. 
The passage that we read today, that long passage of Scripture, John chapter 21, it retells the story of some imperfect, some messy people as well, his disciples. In the last chapter of the book of John, Jesus, as we read, he shows up again, it says, a third time to his disciples after he's risen from the dead. Now, we might be used to this story. Perhaps you've heard it. In fact, it's where the name, the net, came from, this idea that we're providence, we're all in one boat, but the net is trying to do something different than traditional worship. So we're casting our net out of the same boat on the other side of the boat. So maybe you're used to this story. We gloss over the details really easily. But if we dig into it, I think it's got some meat for us today. So I want to talk about two different things as we think about our imperfection. The first thing is that whole fishing bit, right? The whole first half of it before Peter and Jesus have this conversation is they go out fishing. They went fishing all night, and y'all, they caught nothing. Does anyone remember what some of these people did before Jesus called them to follow them around for a few years? Some of them were fishermen, right, by trade. This is embarrassing for them, right? This is supposed to be Jesus' best and brightest, and they spent the whole entire night and caught nothing. To me, that always seems like the silliest thing in the world. How in the world could they go out all night, these people who have done this for most of their lives, and catch not one fish? They should have been good at it. And even more for us readers of this gospel a little bit later, Jesus, the disciples are the one who's going to carry on Jesus' message after he's gone. So shouldn't they be intelligent? Shouldn't they be able to, to provide themselves? They should be the best and the brightest too. But Jesus' band of buffoons, as some people call them, they caught nothing all night. Jesus would have been a little worried perhaps if they couldn't conjure up even one fish in a net. And maybe that sounds ridiculous, my critique of them, but Dave, think about what these disciples have witnessed over the last few years or few weeks. They've healed the, or seen the blind healed, the sick recovered, literally the dead raised. They've been part of amazing miracles, but you're telling me they couldn't catch breakfast. (laughs) Doesn't instill a lot of confidence. It's imperfection at its best. And while we could judge them, and some would, Jesus shows up, and what is Jesus' reaction to them? It's not judgment. It's not worry. It's not how are they representing me? How are they going to carry my name because they can't even fish? What Jesus does is what we've seen him do all along. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't judge. He just simply shows them another way. Again, cast your net on the other side, he tells them, and they catch so many fish that they couldn't haul it all in by themselves. Jesus, non-judgmental, fully accepting of their imperfection, shows them their way one more time. The second part of this passage is Jesus around a fire. They're eating fish for breakfast, it says. And we have this sort of strange question and answer session between Peter and Jesus. Jesus asks him three times, to which Peter sort of takes offense, but answers. Uh, Jesus asks him, do you love me? And Jesus ans- or Peter answers every time, you know I love you, Lord. While Peter seemed was discouraged by this, I found it incredibly encouraging for us. I think it's beautiful reassurance for you and me, imperfect and messy people. The truth is, we won't get it right a lot of the time. More often than not, we'll probably get it wrong. If you are a human being as well, which I suspect many of you out there are, we'll so often try to be good people, spiritual people, but we'll fall short of that. We'll be inconsistent at best. We'll fall asleep while we try to pray. We'll end up on the couch watching Sports Center when we should be reading our Bibles, we think. We'll end up watching a Drake video when we should be writing a sermon. (laughs) And that doesn't scare Jesus off. It doesn't scare God off. Our imperfection doesn't send God packing in our lives. Instead, Jesus tenderly and softly and consistently on his part sits around the fire of our lives and continues to ask us, Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. God keeps inviting us again and again and again into a relationship that is deep, that is meaningful, that can be life-changing. In Iaconelli's book, have I mentioned basically he wrote my sermons for me for the next few weeks? You need to go get this book. So if today's been confusing or not so great, Michael Iaconelli, Messy Spirituality. You need to write it down. It's a fantastic book. But he tells them an old Peanuts cartoon. You know that cartoon with Charlie Brown and Lucy, and Charlie Brown's always sort of the dodo, and Lucy's always telling him what to do. So he tells of one of these cartoons where he says Lucy is out front giving her five-cent psychology for him. Charlie Brown stops by and asks Lucy for some advice. She says to him, Charlie Brown, life is like a deck chair. You know, one of those folding-out chairs. Life is like a deck chair. 
On the cruise ship of life, she says, some people place their chair at the rear of the ship so they can see where they've been. Other people place their chair at the front of the ship so they can see where they're going. She says to him, which way is your chair facing, Charlie Brown? Without hesita hesitation, Charlie Brown, it says, glumly replies, I can't even get my deck chair unfolded. Iaconelli <laughs> 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 says of this, Everywhere I look on the cruise ship of Christianity, I see crews of instructors, teachers, experts, pastors, and gurus eager to explain God's plan for the placement of my deck chair, but he says, I can't even unfold it. No wonder when I peruse the titles in the Christian bookstore, I feel like I'm the only klutz in the kingdom of God, a spiritual nincompoop lost in a ship full of brilliant biblical thinkers. He says, many who go to church want to know God better. We want to do good, but more often than not, we're made to feel as if the mess of our lives disqualified them from the possibility of an authentic spiritual life. I think what he's trying to say is what I hope we all hear today. <laughs> I love saying stuff like this from the pulpit. You're an absolute mess. <laughs> our lives are an absolute mess. If we're really honest with each other, very rarely do we consistently have it together for longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> the truth is that life throws things at us. We make decisions, stuff happens, and our lives are a mess. But this isn't a surprise to God. It doesn't scare God. It doesn't make you any less worthy of God's love. It doesn't mean you can't have a deep and meaningful spiritual life. What it does mean, though, and this is the part of Iaconelli's book that I love so much, he says, what it does mean is that you have to stop pretending. We have to stop pretending. Allow me one more quote from his book. I promise it's the last one. He says, pretending is the grease of modern non-relationships. I love that. Pretending is the grease of modern non-relationships. Pretending perpetuates the illusion of relationships by connecting us on the basis of who we aren't. People who pretend he says they have pretend relationships, but being real is a synonym for messy spirituality because when we are real, our messiness is there for everyone to see. And I think that's what God's desire for us is, to be seen, to be known, to be heard, to be felt, to be fully understood, to be exactly as we are and the people who see us exactly authentic and real, raw as we are, most especially here in church, we don't go running. We say, welcome in. I'm a mess too. You found the right place. In a day and age where social media is how so many of us connect with each other, it's really easy to tidy up our lives. And that's not a bad thing to put your best foot forward. And maybe that's your real life. Some of y'all take amazing vacations, by the way. I've had some serious vacation envy for the last three weeks. So maybe that really is how your life is. But there's honest days too that we don't publish on social media. Ones where we don't get an ounce of sleep. One where we're worried about those around us. One where we don't feel perfect and pretty and beautiful. And that's the realness that we need someone to connect with. That sort of authentic, vulnerable place is hard to share with people. But when we do, we get to be a little bit more ourselves. And we get to love a little bit more of someone else. You know, I, I know I'm saying the same thing over and over and over today but I think it's so hard for us to believe it. Do you believe the message of your own acceptability? Do you believe the message of your own worthiness before God? That you don't have to do a thing for God to say, you are my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. Do you believe that when you bring your honest, honest distracted, authentic, vulnerable, messy self, <laughs> But that doesn't scare God. That doesn't knock you down one rung on the ladder of spirituality that invites you into deeper and more real and more honest relationships with each other, ones where we get to really be. You know, Mary Oliver talks about that in one of her poems, how we can only become when we become together. Meaning the more we share, the more real we get to be. 
relationships. Some people I know they talk about in, in marital counseling, they talk about how you have to hide parts of yourselves or, or some parts shrink so that you guys can be one full whole. But the best relationships, I'm convinced, are ones where we get to grow and flourish and become bigger and more beautiful and more authentic and hotter messes that are loved even more. When you come to church, so often you hear the message that you need to present your best self. That if you haven't done X, Y, and Z, well, that's the reason why your life is the way it is. You know, we have this sort of Christianity that's often taught today that one plus one equals two. This plus this equals God. That's not the way it is. If the disciples are to be believed, yes, there are things we can do. The wilderness series talk about ways that we can put ourselves in front of God. But the truth is, we so rarely have a whole one and a whole one to bring to God. So if one plus one is supposed to equal God, we will always fall short. But the truth is, God just wants our mess. God just wants our honesty, our vulnerability, our anger and frustration. Y'all, that's the real stuff that bothers us. When we're in traffic to when we're dealing with kids to when we're dealing with a spouse or a parent or friends or lack thereof, any of those. You know, I've been having kind of a, a hard week and a half or so. There's just been a lot going on in my own personal life, right? We all go through those moments. My life has just not felt neat. And I've been mad. I, I don't get mad, y'all. I I'm, I'm told someone else this not as like a praise for myself. I told someone this week, the only fight I've ever been with was in seventh grade with Adam Lickman. What's up, Adam? Adam Lickman, he came at me. We're playing street hockey, right? And we're getting into this fight. I would get sort of aggressive, so I probably deserved it. Adam punched me right in the nose, right? Just boom, right in the nose, got a little blood coming down. I turned around and walked away. That's how deeply I believe in nonviolence. I'm not an angry person. I wasn't even really mad at him. I was kind of like, yeah, I deserved that one. And fight him, I'm done, right? You know, I'm not an angry person, but this week something happened, something snapped in me where I finally just got angry with God. I finally just told him in the most non-pastory words I didn't even have to think about conjuring up, just was so honest with my frustration and madness. (laughs) That conversation with God ended in tears. Nothing physically changed in front of me. But when I brought my honest, authentic self, it was like I really got to be, and God could take it. God wasn't worried that I was mad at God. God wasn't worried that in my mind I hadn't been the pastor I wanted to be, the brother, the son, the husband. These things I felt like I was letting people down, right? God said, child, finally you're honest with me. When was the last time you were that honest with God? Maybe you need to get in your car or shut the door or get where no one can hear you so you can say those things that you never thought you were supposed to be able to say. There's things that we hide deep, deep within us because they are such a mess that how could God possibly want this part of us? How could God possibly stay seated around, band as y'all come forward, how could God possibly stay seated around the campfire continue to remind me when I'm bringing him my fears and my doubts. You know, belief is important. This next song, this last song we're about to sing, we talk about how we believe God is the way, the truth, the life. But as the song goes on to say, we get to bring our hopes and our fears and doubts too. We get to bring our imperfect quiet times We get to bring all of our fears and doubts and our pain. Oh, do we get to bring God your pain? Have you given God your pain lately? Your authentic, real, ugly, shouldn't say that out loud kind of pain. Have you given that to God and trusted that God can take it? We get to bring our imperfect quiet times that find us interrupted by kids, work, school, whatever notification pops up on our phone. We get to bring all of ourselves exactly as we are. Not one thing forbidden from our Father and hear God say, yes, child. Hear God say, that's it, daughter and son. That's what I've been waiting for. It's not going to surprise God, scare God. You may not even know how to unfold your chair on the deck of spirituality as the cartoon goes, but neither can I. 
And if your neighbor, if they're really honest, they probably can't either. Or maybe we have, sometimes we finally get it open and we end up on America's Funniest Home Videos because it collapses on top of us once we finally do get it open. We're a mess. But life can get really messy. And every time we admit it, we draw in a little bit closer to God. And God draws a little bit closer into us. When we're honest and vulnerable and authentic and walk with integrity, we find that life may not change in huge, miraculous ways in front of us, but we might hear God in our lives a little bit more. We might be more honest with God a little bit more. We might find ourselves loving others a little bit more, find ourselves love a little bit more. We accept that our messy spirituality is exactly what God wants. I've shared this in closing. I get everyone's attention back. In closing, I've shared this theme. It's the most important Christian theme for me. It drives me every day as a pastor, but as a person too. Imago Dei, that we are all made in the image of God. Every single person, not just here, but every person who's ever been and whoever will be is made uniquely and perfectly in God's image. And we get to go about lives revealing that in each other and letting that be more and more revealed in ourselves. Would you close your eyes and pray this prayer with me? Repeat after me. God. All right, you're not repeating. Let's try it again. Let's pray together. Repeat after me. God, I'm a mess. But you like messy people. I don't have to pretend You love me just as I am. Thank you. I love you. Be with me. Amen. Please stand and worship with me.